So this, uh, this morning, this is the next to the last teaching in our summer series on fruitfulness. We're winding things up next, uh, next Sunday. And we would be amiss if we did not talk about the subject of prayer when, it, uh, when we talk about serving God in, uh, in ministry. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor build in vain. You can talk about serving and giving and volunteering and, and, and all of that, but if God's not in it, if you're not aligned with what God is doing, then what good is it? All this talk about, uh, about, uh, about ministry, uh, we need to talk about prayer as well. And there's no better person who understands this in the New Testament than the Apostle Paul. Talk about fruitful. If you know Paul's story in about a 20-year burst of activity, Paul and his companions almost single-handedly spread the gospel through the whole Mediterranean region of the Roman Empire. And if you ask yourself, how was Paul able to do that? What brought about such prodigious accomplishment? You might say, well, he was shaped for it. Just look at him. And it's true. You think of Paul and the spiritual gifts that he had, his passions, his abilities, his very unique personality, the experiences he went through. People have called Paul the Moses of the New Testament, and that he was. But you look deeper at his writings, and Paul w would say, uh, don't look to me if you want to know why I did so much work while I was able to accomplish so much. It's Jesus working through me. Me, Paul would say, I'm just a foul sinner, the chief of sinners, in fact, saved by God's amazing grace. And any work that I've done, it's been Jesus working through me. And since Paul believed this with all his heart, he was always praying. And his letters, if you read them, just breathe and pulse with prayer. And so he would tell us this morning, any hope that we have for our church for growth and growing in fruitfulness and individually will be found in seeking our Lord. As I spent time walking with Paul the last couple of weeks to set up this teaching, zeroing in specifically on the references to prayer, which saturate uh, his letters, I asked myself, what was prayer to Paul? And I landed on four ideas that I want to share with you this morning, and I want to fire up our uh, slides. And the first idea is this. It, the prayer for Paul was his connection to Christ, first of all. Prayer for Paul wasn't just a ritual. It wasn't just a spiritual discipline or habit. For Paul, prayer was what brought him into the presence of Jesus Christ himself. It was having fellowship with the Lord, having coffee with Jesus, as you've heard me say before. And Paul prayed for others, all the people he was discipling, that they would have this awareness and experience as well. In Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, Paul said, I bow my knees before the Father, and I ask that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. For Paul, prayer meant he was with Jesus and in his presence. Paul could say things like, pray without ceasing. Famous verse many of us know from 1 Thessalonians. What's he mean by that? Not that we should always be jabbering, talking 24-7. Yes, prayer is talking in part, but before we get around to the talking bit, we need to know that prayer is seeking God first. It's, it's turning your heart and mind to God. The idea here is, is that we should constantly be reminding ourselves that we are in the Lord's presence. Psalm 139 says, where, where shall I go from his spirit? Where shall I go from your presence? And what did David mean when he asked that question? Is there any place we can go where God is not? No, of course not. And so prayer is a way that we establish that connection. From God's part, the connection's always there. But from our part, we often forget it, or doubt it, or sabotage it. There's a story I read in, uh, in high school, a short story in a fiction writing class that I've always remembered. I forget the title, I forget who wrote it, but it was a science fiction story about a man who had a an entity with him, an invisible companion from another dimension, from, from outer space somewhere. And that person was always with him and was very real. And the man could talk to this companion and, they would, and he would share wisdom and comfort with him. No one else could see him, just him. But the entity existed solely on logic. 
He was there as long as the man believed in him. But the moment he, he found it logically incoherent that he could have an invisible soul companion, it disappeared. Well, in the story, he reached college, and the man no longer found it logical that he would have an invisible soul companion. And so the entity just disappeared. 20 years he was gone. And then 20 years later, the man's life started to crash and burn, and suddenly he remembered what he used to have, and, and his heart was filled with longing, and it suddenly became logical again that he, he could have this. And instantly, the entity appeared and smiled at him and said, Oh, there you are. That was the story. It's a short story. Well, you can see why it imprinted on me as a, as a young Christian. It's a picture However imperfect, however weird you think the story, it's a picture in a way of our relationship with the Lord. The Lord's always with us, but we're not always with the Lord, are we? And we can go long stretches where we're not thinking of God at all. And yet the moment we call on him, he's there. If we're mindful of him, if I can borrow that overused word today, he's there. So I've gotten in the habit lately, and I think Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, that book we read in the winter, has, has taught me this, the idea of contemplative prayer, where you just say a short verse or a sentence, and, and it quiets your hearts and gets your mind back on, uh, on God. So I've been saying lately the, the phrase, Jesus, I am in your presence. Not as a mantra, but saying it meaningfully, really Locking my mind on the Lord. I'm out jogging and I realize suddenly that my mind's been wandering. And I'll just say, Lord, I'm in your presence right now. Would you run with me? Let's talk. We're in the car, you know. And, and again, mind's kind of, of wandering. And I'll say that, Jesus, I'm in your presence right now. Let's use this time. Let's talk. And that's a helpful thing to do now that, now that we have church magnets applied to our back bumper. It's very good to remind myself that I'm in the Lord's presence because, you know, you don't want to be driving recklessly and, and suddenly be announcing the world, hey, I'm from Bridgeway and I'm driving like a madman. Has anybody else noticed that? If you put, <laughs> Lord, I'm in your presence. <laughs> Help me to drive like there's a magnet attached to my car telling people where I worship. C.S. Lewis said, I pray because I must. I need that connection to Christ. And, and so for Paul, he needed it too, and prayer is what set that in, into, into motion. And once the connection is established, then prayer for Paul obviously became Secondly, conversation with Christ. Paul had some sense that he was communicating with his Lord, where there is talking, and there is listening, and, and there is advice being given, and comfort, and direction. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, I want to see you guys. I, I'm dying to get over your way, but the Lord does not permit it yet. It's interesting language. You say, well, where did Paul get a sense whether the Lord was permitting it or not? It was an inner sense of direction through prayer. The conversation is not audible. The Holy Spirit is at work in our inner being, like Paul said. Paul, Paul also said to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be opened, that you would see the hope of your calling. Well, if we've got an inner set of eyes, we also have an inner set of ears with which to hear the Lord's voice. This is consistent with what the Lord taught us. Jesus said in John 10, my, my sheep hear my voice. And again, this is not audible in a sensory fashion. If any of you say, no, oh, PBC, I've heard the audible voice of Jesus. I'm not saying you can't. I'm not going to tell you what God can and cannot do, but I want you to know I'm putting you on my spiritual watch list. <laughs> if you start talking like that. Because Jesus made it clear in John 14, 15, and 16. It's what we call the tutorial of the Holy Spirit. That's where he lays out what he will do with us and how he will communicate us to us through the Spirit. He makes it clear that this, this talking, this conversation, will be something you will appreciate, but people in the world will not. If it were audible, unbelievers would hear it too. But it's not. So Peter could write in his first letter to the second generation of Christians, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. All of this is inward, this conversation. It's heartward. 
And for that reason, we need to be very humble with what we say we're hearing from God. Now, I've taught on hearing the voice of God before. I've had a whole teaching or two, so I won't go over that right right now. But if this is something that you want to grow in, here are some high-level points that I want you to, to, to know that, of things I've learned about this. If you want to hear the voice of God more clearly, then I've learned that it requires quietness of heart and calmness of mind and listening. And quietness and trust is your strength, the Lord said through Isaiah the prophet. It requires a mind saturated with the Word of God so that you can tell if what you're thinking about inwardly is from the Lord or not because the Lord will not speak differently to you in your heart than He does in the Word of God. So if you want to know if that, that thought is from God or not, well, you've got to get to know how God speaks in the Bible. When God speaks, it's not continuous or obvious, at least for me. Might be for you, not for me. Usually for me, it's, it's a sentence or a thought or an impression. More often than not, it happens when I'm meditating on Scripture. That's why it's so critical that we develop this habit. And since it's not continuous or obvious at first, it's important to talk about having community and sharing with Christian friends. It's important to, to, to be able to have people you can go to and say, I've been getting this sense, I think it's God tell, talking to me, that I should do this, I should think this. And you share it with somebody, and you run it by them, and, and you have them tell you if you're a taco short of a combination plate, or if that's really God speaking. It's a healthy habit to get in. More often than not, another thing I've learned about when God speaks to me is that very seldom does the Lord want to talk to me about other people. 99.9% .9 of the time, He wants to talk to me about me and the moral condition of my heart. Like when, when God came to Cain and He said, Cain, why are you angry? I've heard the, I've heard the Holy Spirit speak that to me. Why are you this? Why are you that? Son, what's going on? That would be God speaking. God coming to Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you? You'll hear the Holy Spirit speak that to you. Where are you? Why are you in this place? What's going on, my child? That's God. The Lord is very much invested in teaching you how to, to live and love the way he does. And so he will speak to you often about your sin struggles and about, uh, about your doubts. David wrote in Psalm 51, Behold, you delight in truth in my inward being. You teach me wisdom in my secret heart. The Apostle Paul experienced this, and he taught this, that prayer is conversation with Christ. Uh, third, Prayer for Paul was a reminder from Christ, particularly about the people in his life. So Paul begins so many of his letters by, by saying, hey, I'm always remembering you in my prayers. This is just a sampling, Romans 1, 8 to 10. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. 1 Corinthians, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. Philippians, Colossians, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we, we pray for you. And like I said, that's just, a, that's just a sampling, some of these verses. You picking up a theme here? And then Paul would prove that he was praying for them and remembering them, because at the end of most of his letters, what's he do? He thanks individually by name, or, or, or he calls people out by name that have been an encouragement to him, or he tells them, hey, remember so-and-so, he was the first convert in Asia. All the people that were companions in Paul's life, he remembered them. And there's power. When we pray for another person, there's power for them, but there's power for us as well in that act of remembrance. I find that when I'm praying for another person, or simply just thanking God for another person, that suddenly there's a, a linkage between me and that person. I found that it helps overcome the fact that I am so stinking selfish, and I am so stinking forgetful, and the world's all about me, that when I take time in, pray, in prayer to start thanking God for each of you and what you represent, 
It warms my heart. It softens my heart. Remember how we said a week or two ago, we said we don't have enough affection in our hearts, natural affection, to love people the way we ought to. And so Paul said to the Philippians, I, I love you with the affection of Christ. This is a way to allow Jesus' affection to start to fill you. So what are you saying, uh, PBC? Do we keep a list of names? Sure. Why not? I think Paul had to have had something written down. He couldn't remember all the people that, that he had crossed paths with in his, in his travels. I'll bet you he did keep something like that. So, so have a list, and provided you don't just parrot out the names that are on that list mindlessly. Ah, oh, bless Frank. Bless Sally. God bless Tommy. Boy. As long as you're not doing that, it's very meaningful. If you say, Lord, I, I thank you for my brother, Andrew. I thank you for, for Rob and Colton. And you call them to mind, and, and you think about them. You just have that. It doesn't take long at all, just a few seconds of meaningful remembrance. Something very powerful can happen. Lord, thank you for so-and-so. Be with them. Let them know you more. I, uh, we had a man came to come to our church in Connecticut a few years ago, and... Uh, did a, did a cool thing, did a weekend presentation, and he, he said, I want your name so I can pray for you. And, and what he's done is he sends out these texts, and I still get them from, from this guy every week. And it's a, my prayer for you is, and it's a scripture verse. And this was like five years ago he came. I have yet to hear from this person. I have never heard an independent note saying, hey, Bear, I've been thinking of you guys, praying for you. Just something simple to let me know that he's really, clearly he's got his secretary or some computer program, and he just spits it out, and, and I'm, I'm prepared to, like, unsubscribe because that's not what Paul did. There was genuine remembering and longing for the people that he loved. So thank God daily. Our church is small enough at this point where you could and should, I would like to commend this project to you. Get a list of everybody in the church, a directory. You can get it through Church Center, or we'll create something to help you. And just once a week, just go through the names in five minutes. Lord, I thank you. And just go and, and read the names aloud of each person and child. You could do it for our missionaries. I think we should, when's the last time you prayed, you remembered one of the missionaries we supported? Just the act of remembering would deepen them in your heart and cause something to change with inside of you. Prayers of remembrance are so very powerful. And speaking of power, that's the fourth thing that Paul thought about prayer. Prayer for Paul was a conduit for re revealing Christ's power. Paul had no doubt that, that prayer changes things, that, Paul had, uh, that, that, that prayer had power. You see it in so many of it, it, the things he said. This famous verse from Philippians, many of you have memorized it. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer has power to God, and so talk to Him often. Pour your heart onto, uh, onto Him. In Ephesians 6, the, right after he's described all the spiritual armor followers of Christ are to put on, he ends that section by saying, pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's interesting. Prayer is not a piece of spiritual armor. Prayer is the way you put on the armor. It's the way you wield your armor. Prayer is so powerful. We struggle with this idea, though, to be honest. Every single one of us, I am sure, believing sometimes in the power of prayer can be a struggle. It's, a, it's an almost universal struggle that God's people had. You can read that of that struggle throughout the Bible. As, as people wrestle with God, I, I, thought, I thought you were more powerful than this. What's going on? You ever had that experience? If prayer is so powerful, why did X, Y, or Z happen? You ever asked that or felt that? If prayer is so powerful, God, why, why didn't X, Y, or Z happen? Pray for kings and those in authority, Paul said to Timothy. Pray for kings that you might have peace. 
And one or two years after he wrote those words, Emperor Nero went ballistic and launched the first Holocaustal persecution against the church, where hundreds were killed, including Paul and Peter and many of the first-generation Christians. Lord, pray for kings, and, and then this happens? There are three things I always remind myself of when I wrestle with the, 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 the power of prayer. I have to remind myself of these three things, and it comforts my heart and keeps me praying. The first is this. I have to remember that every person has their own will and their own freedom. Yes? Prayers that I pray for changing things in myself are often rapidly answered. I can be in the middle of a real busy day, and if I pause for a couple minutes and say, Lord, I've got, I've got three hours of work to do in the next 30 minutes. Help me. And I'm... <laughs> Somehow it happens, and I feel a peace and an order, and I'm able to get the work done. When I'm praying for, Lord, help me control my temper, to love my wife better, or, you know, marriage is a living laboratory. You are given daily opportunities to work on holiness issues in yourself. <sighs> Lord, oftentimes, many times, usually, grace is given at that moment. But once I'm praying for somebody else to do those things, control this person's temper, Lord, help so-and-so control, or even praying for my wife to love me more. <laughs> Lord! No. Those prayers, even that, even, even one step removed from Kevin Bacon, even that is less effective, if you were, works uh, a, a little less consistently. Why is that? Because prayer is not magic. Prayer is not you saying, expecto patroman, and then suddenly they act the way you wanted to. Did I say that right? <laughs> of course I didn't. I've been practicing for a week. What is it? You don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> expecto patroman? No. Petroleum. No. Oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> All right, so when you're praying for other people, they have a say in the matter, do they not? A second thing I keep in mind when I'm tempted to doubt God's power is that God has a will that's different from my understanding. He has something to say about the matter. And if it's not his will in that particular moment, then guess what? My prayers will not work, quote, unquote. Everybody loves to quote Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And then that doesn't happen, and they think that prayer is dumb. But what if your desires are misplaced? See, there's two parts to that verse. The first part of the verse controls the second part. What's the first thing you need to do? Delight yourself in the Lord, it says. And so as you learn to delight in the things that God delights in, and that's a journey of getting to know God. Guess what? Your prayers will start to shift so that you're more in alignment with God's heartbeat and what he wants. You get your prayers more in alignment with what God wants, guess what will happen? You'll experience more power. You know, the prayers will suddenly be working more frequently. We were watching uh, Yellowstone the other night. I'm still trying to decide whether I'm going to bother with it or not. I watch, I'm a screenwriter. I do screenwriting, and I seriously have projects to, to go to Hollywood with. So I study it, and Taylor Sheridan is the writer of Yellowstone, and he's just an awesome writer. So there was this scene we saw last week where Kevin Costner says to his younger son, he says, I used to think there was a plan. But I, I don't believe that anymore. There is no plan. And his younger son says, well, I do believe in the plan, Dad, but the problem is sometimes when you're in the plan, you can't see it. <laughs> Taylor Sheridan, drop the mic. That'll preach. I was like, wow, I wish I'd come up with that. When you're in the plan, it's hard to see. Would you agree with that? It's still hard to see whether I'm going to continue with uh, Yellowstone or not, but it's such a, it's such a dark show, anti-heroes. I don't come away from an hour watching Yellowstone going, boy, that was time well spent. I feel enriched. And, uh, but the acting and the writing, you know, all, there's all that. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, when you're in the plan, it's hard to see. Third thing I keep in mind when I struggle with, oh, prayer doesn't work. You've got to keep in mind the fact of spiritual warfare. Why does Paul say we have to armor up with spiritual armor? Because we are at war. 
There's a real battle going on right now in the spiritual realm that is breaking out around us all over the place. And you can see its devastation with your own eyes. It's very real. Evil trying to overthrow good. Darkness trying to overcome light. And, and so in warfare, the outcomes of individual battles are uncertain. You can lose the battle but still win the war. Our part is to keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep armoring up. Never surrender. So when I remember those things, and my doubts about prayer working... They don't seem quite so severe anymore. So looking to Paul's prayers, uh, what are some ministry prayers we can pray for one another? I want to go through this section quickly because then I want to take just a couple minutes to walk you through uh, a prayer resource we've recently made available. So how do we pray for ministry? Well, write this down. We pray with thanks for one another. The idea being remembrance again. And I want to encourage you and ask you to let the Lord lead you and come up with some lists and come up with some ways, whatever works for you, where you can start doing this. Remembering the people God has put in your life in prayer. Just don't parrot them, but pray for them. Another way Paul says we can practice ministry prayers is praying for open doors. So Paul says several places, Colossians 4, pray for us that God may open a door for the word or first Corinthians 16 a wide door for effective work is open for me and there are many adversaries that's interesting language open doors are, are what I call seasons of spiritual momentum where God is moving and you can see it it's plain as day God's adding to the number daily those that are being saved and prayers are getting answered and, and, it's, and it's exciting and thrilling to be in this these seasons these open door seasons but tell you what if you're in an open door season, there will also be tremendous opposition that starts to come from the enemy. I am praying with all my heart for an open door season for Bridgeway so that we can finally experience what we haven't experienced in a long time, a season of favor and growth and fruitfulness like we haven't seen in, in a couple years. I am praying daily for that. Would you join me in that kind of prayer? Another ministry prayer is pray for boldness to evangelize. Paul says uh, in Ephesians 6, Pray for me that thy words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the gospel, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Well, pray that for each other. Memorize the verse and pray it for one another. We ought to speak boldly for Jesus because there is no one like Christ. Are you convinced of that? If you're not convinced of that, then get convinced of it. There is no one like Christ. There is nothing like the gospel. Are you convinced of that? Or is this Christianity just another, another uh, item on the smorgasbord of possible religions? No, there is nothing like the gospel. There is no book like the Bible. Do you believe that? And there is no peace and freedom like that which following Christ gives. When you understand that boldness, to share it will fill your heart. But there are, there are reasons why boldness in sharing our faith with others is hard to come by. And we should talk to God about it. Is there a, any way in which you're ashamed of the gospel where you're like, uh, uh, talk to God about it. God, give me boldness. Give me the words to speak. Fill my heart with courage to do this so I can honor you. So prayers for boldness and evangelism. Here's a fourth ministry prayer. Pray discipleship prayers for one another. And, uh, and you know what we're talking about here. We've been talking about it all year. We should be praying that we would grow. Pray for one another. In, say it with me. Christ-likeness, fruitfulness, knowledge. Our theme verse for this entire year's worth of teaching. Colossians 1.9. We haven't looked at it in a while. We have not ceased to pray for you. That you, say it with me, may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Swoo. Remember swoo? So as to... Yeah. See, this is how you memorize stuff. You do goofy things so you remember it. Remember we did the... The moonwalk across the stage. And then FBI, 
fully pleasing to him. Say it with me. Bearing fruit in every good work. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Discipleship prayers. Pray this verse for each other. Over and over again. Again, not mindlessly, but powerfully. And fifthly, we should find ways, find any and all ways to pray for one another, period. And as we wrap up this morning, and I was, I'd like you to take out that second handout so we can talk about this for a little bit. We have a prayer ministry. Go ahead and meet the. We have a prayer ministry that's been in place for a number of years uh, where people are available after the service for prayer. And a couple of years ago, when we first got here, we developed uh, some training for that ministry. And, uh, and then we've kind of neglected it. And uh, as we get into the ministry season, we want this ministry to be strong. So uh, we were going to have a training for those that are on our a prayer team. And I said, you know what? We're going to be talking about a prayer, prayer in a, a month or so. I think everybody needs to at least have access to this material, whether you're on the prayer team or not. Because we all would like to know more about how do I pray for other people in the orbit of my life? In a small group, how do we pray for each other? And so let me just briefly walk through this. I'm not going to read it through verbatim. That's for you to do. But I want you to see uh, some of the concepts here. And they will encourage your heart in terms of your own praying for other people. And so the, the purpose of this ministry is to raise up volunteers who can be available after church on Sunday. And, and we're still looking for people that can be part of that rotation. We're asking that God will touch each of our hearts and that each one of us will say, I'm going to help out on Sunday morning in some way. That's one of our, our expectations as we move forward in the fall. Everybody pitch in. Let's make Sunday morning as powerful as possible. And this is one way you could do that. And also to nurture a wider movement of prayer at Ridgeway. The values for this ministry, you can read them. We believe we've been teaching it all summer. We're all priests before God. The Holy Spirit's in us all. You don't have to come to the pastor for prayer. and He does his benediction thing over you. You can go to any follower of Christ. And you can pray, and they can, you can pray together. You can confess sins together. And the Bible commands us that we're to pray for one another. And there's all kinds of scriptures in this, in this training document that you can look up and should look up if you never have before. Jesus told us to pray, and he half dozen different scriptures here on how Jesus taught us to pray. You read through these and look up the scriptures. And know that prayer is something that we need to be taught to do. We don't do it by nature. By nature, you know what we do? We hold up John 3.16 in an end zone. We pray at the end of S4, Lord, please help Albert Pujols get to 700. People do that by nature. To really pray? I do hope he does it, but that's neither here nor there. You have to be, and he is Christian, Lord, so, no, stop. stop. <laughs> Qualifications for this ministry. For those that join the formal prayer team, we want you to uh, ha have some aspect of spiritual maturity. You don't have to be an elder or a formal leader, but if you've been following Christ uh, for, for a while, have you grown in prayer yourself? How about holiness? Again, we're all wounded healers. We all are struggling with stuff. We all need grace. But we want those that are a formal part of the prayer team to have slain some dragons. To, the Bible says, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord's not going to listen to my prayers. So, you know, be, be someone who, who looks at, at, at holiness and, and growing in Christ-likeness is essential. This is key. Humility. You always bring humility to a ministry like this. Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him roughly. What's it say? Gently. But watch yourself. Or you also may be tempted. You think you're something when you're nothing. You deceive yourself. And so to stand as a priest before God and to pray for somebody else, you recognize that you are a sinner saved by grace, just like that other person. And, and you need grace. It's in that spirit you pray for one another. Also, we ask that you have an ability to listen. That's an important part of this ministry. And for those that are formally part of the prayer team, many of them have what we would call the spiritual gift of prayer. They love to pray. They cannot help but pray. That's you. Join the prayer team. 
These are the principles. The next section outlines the principles for the Sunday prayer ministry. And you've seen it with your own eyes, so you get how it's run. We have one man and one woman most Sundays who are available after prayer. Who's, who are, anybody want available this week? We have Lindsay and we have Caroline. And so they'll be in either end of the room. Most times we try and have a, a man, woman, but in, in the sanctuary, in the public place, that's not as important as if you're doing it privately or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we ask that you wear a prayer badge, and if none of you are doing that this morning, don't worry about it, but this is, the, this is how we're training it. Remain available for prayer five to ten minutes after the benediction. Just hang out. And we're encouraging all of you to go and pray because it's a healthy thing to do that. I've gone for prayer. I've got stuff coming up. I want to be prayed for. Don't be embarrassed about it. Begin by simply introducing yourself and saying, how can I pray for you? Number four is very critical. Step two, listen. Step three, listen. Step four, <laughs> listen. Then step five, pray. Yes. Listen, listen, listen. After they've expressed their need, ask only these, any questions that might aid you in praying for them. And then say, hey, let's talk to God about that. Let's pray. It's appropriate uh, in the Bible, we talk about laying on of hands, but it's appropriate to always ask a person you're praying for, are you okay if I do this? Because if you're not comfortable, that's not a problem at all. And some people aren't. Uh, for any variety of reasons. You don't have to be ashamed about that but always good to check. Uh, and then uh, the bottom of page two, just pray naturally, be reasonably short. Jesus told us we're not, we're not heard for our many words, so you don't have to, oh Lord, thy most benevolent de de deity, I beseech thee. <laughs> Where do we get these ideas about effective prayer? No, use your normal language and, t and, and talk and pray for the person, just be yourself. Use scripture if the Spirit should prompt you. Just, you know, the more you pray, the easier this gets. And God, God just starts to do some special things in it. Claim God's promises as, as you pray. Use their name. And if you forget their name, and some of us aren't good with names. How many of you are forgetful with names or terrible with names? <laughs> I, I've been wondering. We had a photo board in our church in Connecticut. Of course, we had our buildings. It was permanently placed. And, and the current membership, we always had photos on that. So... Oh, what's that new couple's name? And you can go over to the photo board and you could look. And <laughs> Frank and Betty, hey. Um, Church Center has a directory. I, I'm wondering if we can get some photos up or something. That would be a useful tool. Anyway, we'll talk about that. But the beautiful thing about Christianity is you have a vocabulary if you forget names. You can say, Lord, I pray for my brother <laughs> or my sister. And it's perfectly fine. But try and remember names. Then there are three seconds. What if, I, what if they're asking prayer for healing? What if the person I'm praying for is ready to accept Christ? And what if what they're asking prayer for has to do with a sin and they want to confess that sin? Well, the next three sections give you some very practical scriptural pointers of what you might do or how you might pray in each of these situations. And that's where I think this training manual is very useful. So with healing, you know, pray for their whole being, body, mind, emotions. Jesus rebuked a fever. It's appropriate to use that language. Lord, I speak against this sickness that's afflicting my sister. Uh, you know, and sicknesses have various reasons and roots. Don't ever presume it's tied into sin or anything like that. Um, don't assume sometimes Satan, scripturally, will send an affliction and sometimes it's just allowed by God because we have broken bodies. So I like to pray, if Satan is in any way behind this sickness, then I rebuke him in Jesus' name and command him to leave my sister alone. So it's appropriate to pray that way. Sicknesses might have unknown roots, so it's appropriate to pray, Lord, your will be done here. But we're praying for healing. We're believing for healing. And don't forget, sometimes sicknesses... Don't just have necessarily a spiritual root. I heard a guy at a conference once who said the most, somebody went up to him and, they, and had a series of headaches that had gone on for days. And the prayer that this, this man prayed for this uh, person was so beautiful because he, it, he said, Lord, uh, it, and if my brother is, 
not taking care of himself the way he should, not getting the rest he needs, if, he's, if, if there's something behind this sickness that he needs to, just to be a better steward of his body, reveal that to my brother's heart. And it, it was just a beautiful blessing that, that uh, you know, spoke to all these possible things that are going on in his life. Prayer is a conversation with God. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. I don't know how many of you, if any, have had a chance to formally lead someone to Christ, but the next section will help guide you through it. We're not going to go through that now. But I want you to begin to prepare your heart for what you would say or how you would pray if someone you're talking to is not a believer, is ready to cross that line of faith. There are some things you ought to do and look for and say in that moment. This section is very, very powerful and useful to you. As is the final section on confession. Confession should become an important part of our praying for one another. This might, it just, you're going to have to let God lead you as these things come up. But always remember as someone, someone comes up and says, oh, I really blew it this week. And they share with you what happened. Well, let's pray, for you. let's pray for you about that. And sometimes it's appropriate for you to prompt them to pray. And say, hey, why don't, why don't you talk to God about that first? Why don't you just pour it out to, in your own words. Tell him how you feel about this. It's very appropriate as you're praying for others, if it seems, if it seems like that's the way God is leading, to get them to pray for themselves first. I found that to be useful in categories like this. With times where you're praying for confession, and again, if it's not here in the sanctuary and it's not in a small group, but you're one-on-one -on -one in a coaching relationship with someone, uh, the last item under confession says it is appropriate to ask the individual what steps they will now take as a follow-up to their prayer of confession. In some cases, restitution may be required or reconciliation should be sought or counseling encouraged. Always important, don't leave people dangling, especially if they start to really lay bare their heart to you. So, uh, final thoughts on this. Though it might sound redundant, remember to pray for the prayer team. And right now we have 10 people, 8 to, t eight to 15 people on it. I need to pray through the list. <laughs> so we've got a good group of people each week. We need more men. All right, write that down. Number 1A. I don't know why men struggle. It's less of a struggle in this church, but that doesn't surprise me. We've got great men in this church, but, but we've got we've to be prayer warriors. We've got to lead in prayer, men. If you can't serve on Sunday, as with all ministries, if you can't serve, be responsible. Be a good steward. Get a replacement. Make sure that you don't just blow it off. And then here's a key point. When we give the benediction on a Sunday, we'll often say, pray for one another. I mean that. Even if you're not scheduled on a given Sunday, as you're having fellowship with people afterwards or having coffee or talking, it may be that, that the Lord will lead you to want to pray for them. And so say that. Look for opportunities where you can pray a short prayer blessing for someone and, and encourage them through your prayer.